to Hebrews chapter 8. <coughs> To look at some things in this section here from, from chapter 8 through to chapter 10 because it, it really fits into where we last left off in our study of Book of Acts. If you remember, we were in chapter 15 at the uh, council in Jerusalem, and the Paul and Barnabas went down, and so did Peter, and uh, all of the church leaders met together because there were some Jewish Christians. Uh, that is, Jews by nationality who had become believers in Christ, who were thinking that they needed to go back, or at least to keep, all of the laws of Moses. And that the covenant was still a valid covenant, the old covenant that God had given. And they were wanting to force that upon the Gentiles, which in the specific <coughs> incident uh, meant that the Gentiles would need to be circumcised uh, in order to become members of the covenant. And of course, so they had this big discussion and uh, the church leaders had come to the conclusion, no, Christ has fulfilled the old covenant. It is no longer um, an act of covenant. And therefore, we will, they will not put any restrictions or demands upon any Gentile and even for that matter, upon any Jew who becomes a believer. So at this moment, it is guaranteeing to us that the church in its, uh, in its infancy had definitely made the split between Judaism, which is now the celebration or the keeping of the old law, and the new covenant, which is in Christ by faith. Okay? So we've had this. Now the problem is that this issue kept coming up over and over again. In fact, as we continue in our study in Acts, we're going to see it a couple more times and how it came up. And specifically, it comes up in the, in the area of the um, um, circumcision. One of the things that we had looked at when we were doing chapter 15 was that we went to the book of Galatians but we also went to the book of Hebrews, to Hebrews chapter 8, where it talked about the, um, the new covenant. And while I was reading that, I said, I, uh, I was, the Lord was putting into my mind that there are some things here that we need to learn and understand, uh, in addition to, to what, how we had looked at it before. So that's what we're going to do today. And so I've chosen as my specific text, uh, Hebrews 8 verse 3, which reads, to every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, <clears throat> we've been, in our scripture reading, we looked at um, Genesis chapter 14. The, um, the narrative of when Ched Cheddar... Alomar, Cheddar Leomar, Mr. Cheddar, Mr. Cheese, let's just <laughs> who had um, conquered all of the, um, the possessions of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and including Lot, Abram's nephew. And he had um, um, come against, he was four armies against the five armies who were rebelling <coughs> against him, but he had won the battle. So Abram, when he learned that Lot had been taken captive, he decided that he was going to go and rescue him. And he took an army of 318 relatives, and he pursued um, Cheddar Leomar and defeated him and rescued the prisoners, including Lot. And then he returned all of the possessions to the king, uh, kings of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, obviously, this was a miraculous victory. Cheddar Leomar was uh, had an, an allied army of thousands of uh, fighting men. And all of the combined armies, even when they were outnumbered by his enemies, um, they could not defeat him. And yet Abraham was able to defeat him and rescue Lot. 
So when Abram brought all of the uh, possessions back, and, um, the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, Gomorrah went out to meet him, and the, he returned all of the possessions to them. And you can imagine that the reunion of families and possessions was probably uh, filled with joyful tears. So the two kings wanted to, um, uh, the king of Sodom and the king of Salem, who also kind of showed up. This is the first time he is ever mentioned. The king of Salem comes along with king of so Sodom. And they want to thank Abraham in a very tangible way. So the king of Salem offered Abraham some of his possessions, but Abraham said, no, I'm not taking any thanks at all. And really that was just a recognition that uh, Abraham is saying, it wasn't my victory. <laughs> the thanks goes to God. He's the one. So I am not going to take any credit for God. Now we know in the future references that uh, it was to his credit also that uh, he didn't take it. Um, but that's another <clears throat> message. The king of Salem, whose name is Melchizedek, also it, it tells us in, the, in Genesis 14 that he came to him, to Abraham and his men. Now it says that he brought to him bread and wine. Now, one of the things we've got to be careful is that we don't, in that text, in the, in the historical narrative, is that we don't make that mean something that it doesn't mean. When we think, when we read that bread and wine, what immediately came to your mind? The communion. Right, the communion. Okay. But all it is telling us is that this king of Salem, Mr. Melchizedek, King Melchizedek, brought refreshment. He brought food and he brought drinks <laughs> to Abram and his man. He fed them and made sure that they had plenty to drink. That's what all of that means. So let's not take it any farther. The, neither the Psalm 110 brings that out, neither does the only other passage that talks about this, which is Hebrews 7, does not talk about this at all. So we've got to be careful. We don't make the scriptures say things that it doesn't mean. Right? And it's very easy to, to interpret that. In fact, some people take it a little farther and say, well, that means that this Melchizedek was, in fact, Jesus himself. But the, there's absolutely no... Nothing in the text, in any of the text, to indicate that this was Christ. In fact, the, the Hebrew 7 passage is helping us to understand that Melchizedek was just a man. And even though Hebrew 7 tells us that he had no mother or father, it's only because the Holy Spirit, in his inspiration with Moses, didn't mention that. Melchizedek just shows up. And then disappears from the biblical record until we come to David 800 years or so later in Psalm 110. So we have to be careful. Um, be certain to hear that Melchizedek is just a historical person who did have a father and mother at one time and he died. But the absence of it, of the mention of his lineage and his parentage, um, and even how he became a priest of God, as the text in Genesis does say that, um, is left unknown to us. But that's what the author of Hebrews uses to help us to understand Christ's high priesthood and what God was saying in Psalm 110. And I'll come to that in a second. So the, the, the king of Salem, Melchizedek, acknowledged, acknowledged that God the Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. So he certainly had a knowledge of God, of Yahweh. Uh, he had the same kind of knowledge of God as Job had. <clears throat> Job is pre-Abraham. We don't know where he got his knowledge, uh, but obviously through the teaching that came uh, from um, uh, Noah and his sons, somehow was, was kept alive so that we had righteous people who were worshiping God. And this Melchizedek was one of them. And uh, he worshipped God and thanked God for delivering Abraham, uh, for de delivering the enemy of Abraham into his hand. In response, Abraham voluntarily and not out of compulsion, and this is important to understand, uh, it was not according to any law. So Abraham didn't have to do anything. But he gave Melchizedek a tent. And what it was telling us is that... Um, um, Abraham did something that later became law in terms of uh, 
uh, of payment to a priest. So the recognition under the old law of the priesthood was that they could demand by law tithes from the people. And the people would pay those tithes to the priests that in recognition of the fact that they were priests and had no other living. Okay, so Abraham now does this without ever having any law to again emphasize in for us that um, Melchizedek um, had some kind of um, priesthood uh, that is beyond the law and yet Abraham recognizes. Now in Hebrews 7, um, the pastor of Hebrews uh, is going to tell us that um, Melchizedek is actually a greater king than Aaron or Levi in the Old Covenant because they are only priests, I say greater king, I mean greater priest, uh, they are only priests by descendants and by law. So the law says the priesthood will follow the line of Levi and the sons of, of Aaron, or um, yes. Yeah. And um, um, and so it became a descendant. So you had to be uh, born into the line of the priests under the old covenant to become that. Whereas Melchizedek is a greater priest because he was not born into any line, but was in fact a priest of God. But we have no idea how or why that came about. And Abraham paid him. Uh, um, the tithe to acknowledge uh, his relationship with God. We're going to come to when we come to from the next time we read about Melchizedek is Psalm 110 verse 4 where it says the Lord has sworn um, and will not change his mind you, referring to Jesus are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. From there, the author of Hebrews builds on Psalm 110, verse 4, and reintroduces Melchizedek in Hebrews 5, 6, and expounds its significance in Hebrews chapter 7. So everything we know about Melchizedek, from, it comes from Genesis 14, verses 18 to 20, Psalm 110, verse 4, and Hebrews chapter 7. And what we need to understand is that in these three texts, the first is the historical uh, gives us the historical context, and the second is the prophetic context, where God tells it to Christ, and so it takes on a prophetic meaning, and the third in Hebrews 7 is the theological, it's the interpretation to help us to understand how those other two things connect together. <clears throat> So when we come to Hebrews chapter 8, to put it into this context, um, verse 1 says, now the point of what we're saying is this, that we have such a high priest. In other words, we have a high priest who is greater than Melchizedek. Because the whole point of chapter 7 is to tell us that Melchizedek, by virtue of the fact that the Holy Spirit did not reveal his, his past or even his future, except that he was appointed by God and not by law, and Abraham gave him a tent, which made Melchizedek and the order of Melchizedek's priesthood a higher plane than the, than the, um, the priesthood of the Old Covenant, because the priesthood of the Old Covenant was all by law and, and uh, uh, descendants. Right? So, um, there, and, and you gave a tithe to them out of the law and not from your heart. So you have the old covenant priesthood is on the bottom. Then you have the Melchizedek priesthood, which is above it. But then it tells us that the Melchizedek priesthood <coughs> is a type of Christ. So that we need to understand that Christ is a priest with who is an eternal priest. And we see this in, in Hebrews 7, uh, verse 3. It says, uh, He is without father and mother or genealogy. Okay? We're contrasting the, the law. He, um, in other words, he is without a priestly genealogy. That's what it's referring there to. Okay? Not a human genealogy. Again, he's not Christ. He is a human. Uh, 
without father or mother to emphasize the eternal aspect of having neither beginning of days nor end of life. In other words, it was not in the record. He appears to be a guy that just always existed, but resembling, there's the key word, resembling the Son of God, he continues as a priest forever. And the, the author of Hebrews takes that word forever and, and amplifies it through the rest of the chapter to show to us that um, the, the priest of the law is not forever. Each individual, they're, they're born, they die, they're born, they die, they're born, they die. As long as there's somebody born into the family, there will always be a priest. But it is only perpetual through the death of a previous. So it's not eternal at all. Whereas Melchizedek symbolically resembles an eternal <coughs> priesthood. And therefore, when God said in Psalm 110, prophetically to Christ, before the world was ever created, I have made you a priest put, uh, throughout all of eternity in the same manner that Melchizedek is a priest on an earthly plane as being an eternal priest which is above and greater than the priesthood of the, of the law. Okay, everybody follow that? Mm -hmm. Right? That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now, so that's when we come back to Hebrews 8, verse 1. This is now the point of what we're saying. Uh, um, so is referring back to the end of chapter 9 from verse 26, 27, 28. Because what it is telling us there that at the end of chapter 7 is that, that the kind of priest that we need is not a priest who's bound by law, nor even a priest like Melchizedek, because he's still within the earthly realm, but we need a priest who is uh, overseas the heavenly and the spiritual realm where God is, that's the kind of priest that we need. So look at verse 26 of chapter 7. It is indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest who is holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Okay? Uh, he has no need like those high priests in the law to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people referring to the Day of Atonement, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in the weakness as a high priest. But the word of the oath, that's referring to Psalm 110 verse 4, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect. And you see the word, the next word again? Forever. So that ties back now to 7 verse 3. Melchizedek is forever. Jesus is forever. But Melchizedek is an earthly priest, whereas Jesus is a heavenly priest with eternity in his forever and appointed by God, whereas <coughs> and not by law. So chapter 8, verse 1. Now the point is that we are saying that we have this kind of priest. All right, so now, now before I go any further, I just want to give you a little bit of context to the book of he Hebrews so that you can see how this all fits in. Because we're going to focus in um, on, the, uh, on Jesus as the high priest and what, the, what is the significance of the sacrifice that he made. Because look at the, our verse again, if we go back to it. It says, every high priest within the law has to, is appointed to make gifts and sacrifices. Now the gifts and sacrifices is plural. So what it's doing is it's pointing to the perpetual, continual offering of these things and their ineffectiveness. They're ineffective by virtue of the fact that they have to keep offering. Okay? So that, they're appointed to do that under the law, but it's ineffective. Thus it is necessary for this priest, that is the priest, that is, um, that is the type, or the anti-type, of the Melchizedek priesthood as an eternal priesthood, which is the type. This priest, so Jesus himself, also is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. So from here on, the author of Hebrews is going to focus on what it is that he offers. So putting it into context now into the book of uh, Hebrews, um, 
I, I title the book of Hebrews, The Lesser is Gone, the Greater is Here. Um, because it always talks about uh, the things that are greater. But it's, it says, there's a greater sanctuary, but it, repeat, it replaces the lesser sanctuary. There is a greater sacrifice, which makes the other sacrifices, the lesser sacrifices, not only inefficient, but absolutely no longer required. And there's a, a, a greater um, covenant, um, because it's got greater promises. Um, because the old covenant just is inefficient and doesn't deal with the sin issue, nor does it open the door for us to come to the presence of God. That, that's the whole argument here of the, whole, the book of Hebrews. Now Hebrews, I, I divide it into four parts. The first part, which is from um, chapter 1, verse 1, right through to 4.13, sort of gives us a short history of the disobedient people of God. So it recants the, um, the children of Israel, who are the people of God symbolically who came out of Egypt, but they rebelled and they continued in their sin through the wilderness and never did enter the, the promised land. They had no faith, so they were not saved. So it gives us that history of the disobedient people of God. Part 2, uh, from 4.14 to 10.18, now is talking about the son's priesthood. And again, how he it is greater than, than uh, the, um, the old priesthood. Part 3. Um, comes back to the history of God's people, but now it's God's faithful people, the ones who follow this great high priest um, who is the Son of God, from 1019 to 1229. Then the last part, which is uh, chapter 13, um, are the instructions for the life of gratitude and godly fear. Because the conclusion of it all is this, that the, Jesus being the high priest Offering a single sacrifice has not only um, pay, covered the <coughs> payment for our sin, but has removed sin and its effect from us in such a way that we have been made holy and now are allowed into the presence of God. And being in the presence of God, then we live a life of gratitude and godly fear. And chapter 13 gives us some instructions of how we do that. So that's the whole book of Hebrews, really, in a, in a nutshell. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is we're going to focus in on this section, this uh, section here on the son's priesthood. Um, but we're only going to look at the section from 8.1 to 10.18, where it's actually now... Tell him talking to us about this high priest, all sufficient sacrifice. This is this section, 8 1 down to 10 18, it kind of goes together. And what we have, some people have described this as kind of like a, a three movement symphony. Uh, have you ever gone to the symphony? You, you get the first movement, then you have a break, and then you come back and you have the second movement, then there's a break. And, then the third movement, and it all culminates, right? But you get a little bit of information in the first part, get a little more in the second part, and then you get the, the finale, and you come away just uplifted and rejoicing. Well, that's what this section does here. In, in part one, which is uh, chapter eight, verses one to 13, um, uh, it actually breaks into three parts, where it talks about the sanctuary, <coughs> and compares the sanctuary that Jesus is a priest of versus the sanctuary that the, the priests of the Old Covenant are priests of. So, and then it talks about the sacrifices, again, comparing the two sacrifices, and then the covenant. Okay, then part two, from 9, 1 to 22, does the same thing. So again, it talks about the sanctuary, gives a really good description of the sanctuary, and uh, then talks about Jesus' sacrifice compared to the sacrifice of the bulls and goats, and then the covenant again, and the new covenant versus the old covenant. Then part three does the same thing, talks about the sanctuary, the sacrifice, and the, uh, the covenant. And we're going to just focus in on these three sections here on the sacrifices um, today. And, uh, right there. So, specifically, then we're going to look at 8 verses 3 to 6. 9 verses 11 to 15, and then 9.25 to 10.15. And again, you look at that, and so you've got three verses in the first part. You've got um, 
four verses in the next part, and then you got a whole, um, however many verses in the next part. <laughs> a lot more. So you see how it crescendos. But the other thing you, you, you sort of understand here is that, again, um, the sacrifice of Christ is central to this whole message. It's not the sanctuary, and it's not even as much as the covenant. But it's the sacrifice of Christ that is central to this whole thing, and that's why we want to focus in on it uh, today. <clears throat> All right, I'll come back to that. All right, so this is where we are. Now, hopefully, I can get this good for you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I didn't have a lot of time this week to work on this, but I was so excited that uh, it's coming. So the Lord's going to do His part. I'm the vessel, and uh, He's going to give you, uh, make it work for you this morning uh, uh, through me. And that's all we ever ask. Okay, so let's come to this 8th chapter, uh, uh, verse 3, which is our key verse. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices... Thus, it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Okay, so all priests have to make sacrifices. And why do they have to make sacrifices? Because there is what kind of a problem? A sin problem. A sin problem, all right? But not only a sin problem, but a separation problem. Okay, we are separated from God because of the sin. So we have a sin problem and a separation problem. And the sacrifices are meant... To take care of both of those things. Okay? But in the old system, it was many sacrifice, gifts and sacrifices. But in Christ's um, priesthood, it's only a single sacrifice. And he does have something to offer. And uh, verse 4, now if he were on earth, that is if Christ was on earth, uh, in an earthly priesthood, so he's talking about if Christ was part of the um, old covenant priesthood, he would not be a priest at all. Why would that be? Because he wouldn't have to do the work. The old covenant priesthood, the line is what? It's based on a genealogy. <coughs> Jesus is of what tribe? Judah. Judah. What is the tribe of the priest? So Jesus can't possibly be a priest in the old covenant. That's what that verse is, is saying there. And the priesthood that is of the Old Covenant is a priesthood of law. So it's not based on any particular um, strength or, or power or anything about the Levites and, and the descendants of Levi. It's all by law. That's why in the Day of Atonement, the high priest has to make a sacrifice for himself as well as a sacrifice for the people. Because, but Jesus does not have to make a sacrifice for himself because he is already perfect from 7 verse 26. All right, so let's go move on here. Um, <clears throat> verse 5. They serve a copy, that is the priests of the law, the Levites, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things. Now this is going back to verse 2 where it says um, that um, um, we have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the holy places in the true tent. Okay, so the true tent. Now, so what is it talking about? Where's the true tent? In it's in heaven, where Jesus is. Okay, so that's the true sanctuary. There's a contrast between the heavenly sanctuary and temple or tent. Specifically, it's using tent to refer to the tabernacle, but it always includes the temple. Okay, so there's the, there's the heavenly sanctuary, and, and in the tent we have the Holy of Holies, which is where God's presence is. So Jesus is in heaven where God is, and, but they serve in a copy of that. Now here's a, one of the coolest things you maybe didn't understand before. Um, they serve a copy and shadow of the heavenly things, for when Moses was about to erect the tent, that is the tabernacle of the earthly one, he was instructed by God saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown to you on the mountain. Sometimes we, we get mixed up here. We think that the, te the, the um, tabernacle with the Holy of Holies and the, I'll go to that, this here, 
the most holy place and the holy place. We, we think that this is a type or a picture, a pattern based on the one in heaven. That's not true. God had a pattern, a plan, that he brought to Moses, and he said, I want you to build it based on this plan. It's not a type of the one in heaven. It is only a, in its operations, it's going to be similar to, but not as efficient to, what Christ does in the new temple. So the temple in heaven is totally different. As a matter of fact, and I'll, oops, as a matter of fact, when Jesus died, what happened to this temple? Let's pretend this is the temple. Right. The temple was torn apart. Who tore it apart? God did. Now, we often think that the reason God did this was to symbolize that we now have access to God. But that's not what it is. It was actually to show to the Jews that ever since the days of Ezekiel, God was not there. Why was the curtain there? Because man could not come into the presence of God. God took away the curtain so the man didn't have to fear because God was not there. Where is God? Where is the presence of God? It's in the sanctuary in heaven. What was the other thing that happened? Okay. God wiped out the entire thing in AD 70. There's three parts to the, to the ministry. There's the Holy of Holies, the holy place where the daily um, sprinkling of the blood is done, and then there's the brazen uh, altar where the sacrifices are actually made. Jesus, what we're going to discover in our text here is that Jesus dying on the cross was like the offerings on the altar, which are outside of the temple, but he did not have to go into a holy place on a daily basis because his sacrifice was once for all, and he only goes to where God's presence is, but not in the temple at all. It's where God happens to be. So, keeping that in mind, <clears throat> let's move on here. We've got to get through this. So, we come here then to um, um, verse 3, uh, oh, we're at verse uh, 6, verse 6. Verse 6 now um, is in contrast to verse 4. Verse 4 says, now if he were on earth, he would be a priest he would not be a priest of all. That's because he's not a descendant of Levi. Then verse 6 says, But as it is, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the one of Levi on the earth. In verse 4. Why is that? How did he get that? It's referring back again to Psalm 110, verse 1 and 4. God gave the invitation to Christ, sit at my right hand, and I will wait, and you are an everlasting king, uh, an everlasting priest. <clears throat> so it's, it is totally different. And the old is not a pattern of that, but is a pattern, but an inferior pattern. So it's a pattern of what Christ does as a priest, <coughs> but not a pattern of the heavenly king. So that, that's that whole section thing. Than the sins. So God, Christ has been appointed of God for a more excellent ministry, which is appropriate for a heavenly sanctuary. And what's the difference between the two? Is that there is a better covenant with Christ, with better promises. All right. So that brings us now to the second section in nine verses eleven to fifteen. In nine verses eleven to fifteen. The first part of chapter 9, 1 to 10, it's describing to us the whole temple, this, this whole thing. It's describing the, the layout and then what, what it is that the priests have to do. But uh, in order to show that, it, it describes the earthly sanctuary in order to show that no access to God was possible through its ministries. Look at verse 8. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet open as long as the first section is standing. Okay? So the most holy place, which is where God is supposedly dwelling, you can't get there except through the holy place. 
But you can't go into the holy place without having made the sacrifice. So as long as that holy place exists, then there is no access to God. That's what it's saying. Okay, verse, uh, uh, it indicates that the way into the holy places to where God is is not yet open as long as that first section is there. So that's why, again, God destroys the physical building to show that Christ eliminated that first section and, in fact, totally eliminated the whole thing so that there is access to, to God. <laughs> and the sacrifices of the earthly sanctuary, sanctuary um, were the reason that there is no access to God. That's what verse 9 is telling you. According to the arrangements, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience. So there's the two things. We've got to keep this in mind. Access to God and the cleansing of the conscience or the dealing with the sin issue. The removal of the sin nature from the heart of man. Those are the two issues that, that have to be dealt with. And the old covenant, the sacrifices and the system cannot do it. That's why it needs to be done on a perpetual basis. So in verses 11 to 15 is a description then of Christ's work. Christ has entered the true heavenly sanctuary in verse 11. Uh, because his, his sacrifice has done away with the sin, which the old covenant could, couldn't do in verse 13. And it removes the sin, verse 14, and also um, um, and puts in a new nature within us. It made Christ the mediator of the new covenant in verse 13. 50. That's the, sort of the summary of it there. So in verse 11, Christ is returned to God's presence as the high priest of God's people. Right? So this is talking about the, um, um, the ascension of Christ. When he went up to heaven, he, Christ is returned to God's presence as the high priest of God's people. Uh, he has fulfilled God's invitation to sit at God's right hand. Okay, that's Psalms 110, verse 1a. So flip back to that again, so you can see that. So the Lord Yahweh, that's God, says to my Lord Adonai, that's Christ. This is his invitation to him. I'm inviting you to sit in my right hand. That's what God says to, to, to Christ. And 9-11 is referring to that. So Christ then appeared as the high priest in heaven. So it's the fulfillment of God's invitation to, um, uh, to sit at his right hand as the savior of humanity. Now Hebrews brings this out many times. Look at uh, 8 verse 1 again. Now the point in what we're saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is what? Seated, Seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. Look at, go flip back to chapter 1, verse 3. <coughs> verse 3. Speaking again of the sun. Okay? Uh, he says, the sun is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications, he sat down where? The right at the right hand. Okay? And, and then, um, now look at 1, verse 13. 1 verse 13. To which of the angels did God ever say, what's it quoting? Psalm 110 verse 1. Sit in my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. God didn't invite anybody else but Christ himself to be the Savior of the world and to sit at his right hand. And so now, not only did he have an offering to make, which is more superior than the offerings of the old covenant, which brings in the new covenant, but now this offering has made it so that he can actually accept the invitation of God to enter into heaven as our high priest. So the offering, the sacrifice of himself, is the means of Christ actually going into heaven. It didn't just happen. Because that's where Jesus belongs. Jesus could not return to heaven if he had not made the sacrifice of himself. And that uh, um, verse... Uh, uh, verse 12. He entered once for all into the holy places. Okay, that's the presence of God. It's, uh, it's now talking in symbolic language to compare it with the old. Uh, 
not by means of loving goats and calves, which is what the high priest does in the Day of Atonement, but by means of his own blood, um, thus securing an eternal redemption on the cross. Okay? So the sacrifice outside on the cross of Calvary, just like the sacrifices of the old on the brazen altar, the sacrifices on the altar of the Old Covenant only had significance if you can get it into the presence of God, into the Holy of Holies. It only happens once a year by the high priest only, and only after he has made a sacrifice for himself and a, an additional sacrifice for the people. Whereas Christ is on the cross, and it's his death on the cross that secures our eternal redemption. At the cross. Didn't even have to bring it into, into God's presence yet. Because the cross, his death on the cross, finalized the requirement. It removed the sin, and it made access to God available to all those who believe. Without him having to do anything else. But now, having done that, he accepts God's invitation to come to heaven as the high priest, to sit at God's right hand, and now to make it so that he has all of the power and authority to help his faithful people to live for him. Until the enemies are made his footstool, and then he returns, takes us to, to, to be with him, and brings about the final judgment on everyone else. See how that fits in? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, now that brings us then to verse um, uh, 13. For if, and the if is important here, if the blood of goats and bulls, that is the ones done in the Day of Atonement, and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of the hammer sanctified um, for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ? So, in other words, he's saying, you know, the, the sacrifice of the Old Covenant did have significance, it's just that it didn't have any kind of lasting significance. It was not sufficient or effective in its work. So it had to be done annually and other sacrifices done daily. So how much more then, uh, verse 14, would, would the blood of Christ, and when it's talking about the blood of Christ there, it's not just the shedding of Christ's blood. In fact, the Old Testament tells us that the life is in the blood. So when he uses the phrase, the blood of Christ, or the blood of bulls, it's actually talking about the whole life, not just the, the physical blood, but the whole life of the person. So, in other, so you can substitute there the life of Christ, um, who through the eternal spirit offered himself. So Christ offered his life, not just his blood, but his life, his life of obedience, without blemish. Okay? Christ was sinless, he offered it to God. And what happened? Two things. He purified our conscience. Now, that word conscience is not as we think it in our English language when we talk about conscience as, as I have a conscience that helps me to be able to, to determine between right and wrong. Okay? Uh, that, we do have that. But when it talks about conscience here, it's talking about um, uh, the actual nature, the heart of man. So the inner man, we have a nature there that hates God. And the sacrifice of Christ was able to purify the conscience. It was able to remove the heart of sin and replace it with a heart of flesh, which happens to be Ezekiel's description and even Jeremiah's description in chapter 8, which he, he quotes. Right? He will put the laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. God puts a new nature. But the sacrifices of the old couldn't do that. But Jesus' offer of his life brings about this purity, this purifying of our inner man from the dead works, the effects of, of sin. And what's the next thing? In order to serve the living God. So it deals with the sin problem, and it deals with the separation problem. The other things couldn't do it. But Christ's sacrifice could. Therefore, and because that his sacrifice was efficient and sufficient, verse 15, therefore he is the mediator of the new covenant. In other words, the new covenant could not be brought into, into fruition unless or until Jesus died on the cross. 
That's when it started. It was inaugurated right at that moment when Jesus' life was taken from him in his death. So he becomes the mediator of the new covenant so that those who are called, again, this is a reference back to uh, Romans 8, made that we are called, we are elect. It's not, again, based on anything that we do, but it's based on God's sovereign grace. Those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. And that's what it's talking about in verse 11 when it says the good things. <laughs> we got a lot of good things because of what Christ did. The first is that our sin problem was taken care of. We've got a new nature. God's law is now written on our hearts. Okay? We've got a mediator who's sitting in heaven who is now able to purify us and help us to, to live a life um, of sinning less okay? until the day when we are sin less. And uh, we are also now allowed into the very presence of God. Our separation from God has been taken care of. And that's what the new covenant is all about. That eternal inheritance. And then Ephesians 1, remember we studied that, um, which talks about all of the benefits of our inheritance. Since a death has occurred, verse 15, the end of verse 15, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. The writer here is telling, listen, you guys, you're thinking about going back to this old system. But this old system couldn't do anything for you. He says, Christ's sacrifice actually redeems you from all of those sins that those sacrifices were made for but couldn't atone for. It covers you. Why would you go back to an inferior system? All right. So... That brings us then to the, 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 the third part, which is chapter 9, verse 25. Chapter 9, verse 25. All the way down to 10, verse 14. And I, I'm not going to go through each verse here, but I'm just going to bring out some highlights. Because th there is so much in this section that it just blows my mind. As I was studying, and I was just... It was like, it was like wow, 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 and wow, and more wow. <laughs> all the way through it. So the first thing that we're going to see here is that in verses 25, 9, 25 down to 10, 4, we have a focus. The author of Hebrews is focusing on the once for all aspect of Jesus' um, death. So you can see that in verse uh, 26. In uh, uh, verse 26 it says, um, as it is he, that is Christ, has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice himself. Verse 27, and just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, so Christ having been offered once. Okay, so we have that emphasis there. And, and then the contrast in 10 verses 1 to 4, where under the old situ situation, okay, you have, um, it can, those, uh, those are, under the law, it's just a shadow of the things that by those same sacrifices, they are continually offered every year. Um, and uh, verse 3, in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sins every year. Every year for you, the Day of Atonement. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay, and specifically, it's referring to that sin nature. It can't solve the sin nature problem. Only Christ did. So that's, a, that's the focus there, that Christ's sacrifice is a once-for-all sacrifice. It is sufficient and efficient. Then in verses uh, 5 to, uh, uh, to 10, in verses 5 to 10, we have this focus here, which we see in verse 7 and 9. Look at the 7. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's quoting from the Old Testament here, but it but it's uh, quoting it in such a way that this is Christ that is speaking. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your what? Your will, O God. And then verse 9 says, Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. That's why Christ came. And, and we gotta, we got to realize that at the heart of the gospel, Christ did not come to save us. Christ did not die on the cross because he loved us. Christ did not think of us on the cross. That's why I changed that last line in, in that song that we sing, um, Above All. Okay? He, he did not think of all. This is the emphasis here in this whole, in these verses. I have come to do the will of God. 
And the will of God is that he, look at the um, end of verse 9, to do away with the old sacrifice and establish the second. What does that mean? In establishing the new covenant, he removes the heart of sin, puts a new nature within us so the law of God is written in our hearts, and he makes the separation between us and God disappear. That's the whole thing. He wasn't thinking of us, he was thinking of God. God created us, his image is in his image to, uh, to know him, and, uh, and sin has interfered with that, but it has also helped us to see more of God. We would things of God that we would never understand if sin um, didn't exist. And we, we see God, and, and now we are united with Him because of the sacrifice of Christ. Because Jesus came to do God's will. That's it. His Philippians uh, 2, okay, um, He willingly died. That was Jesus' will. And then verse 10, And by that will we have been sanctified. Uh, we have been made holy. Sanctification means to be made holy. We've been made holy through the offering of the body of Christ once for all. So now he joins those two thoughts together again. So the will of God is that, that uh, he deal with the sin issue and the separation issue. And it happened through uh, the body of, of Christ that was offered once for all. Then the last section, verses 11 um, uh, down to 14. <clears throat> Uh, the focus here now is, uh, the focus of the first part is once for all, and the second part to do your will, and this third part, he sat down. Look at what it says, verse 11. Every priest, talking about the in the old system, every priest stands daily. Stands at his service, stands when he's making offerings, stands when he makes sacrifices, he, and he can never take away sins. In other words, he never sits down. He can't stop making those sacrifices he has no time to sit down because it is not doing the job verse 12 but when Christ offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins he sat down at the right hand of God waiting for that time until his enemies should be made his footstool again that's part of the invitation in Psalm 110 verse 1 for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. See, God has rejected, verses 8 and 9, God has rejected the whole old system. Not because they practiced hypocrisy. And some people say that. Well, they did it under hypocrisy. That's not the problem. The problem is not the hypocrisy. The problem is the system. The problem is the law. The problem is the, the blood of the bulls and goats. It can't accomplish what it was supposed to do. All it does is it fundamentally shows to us that we continue to have a sin problem and a separation from God. And then verses 10 and 11 says that Christ came to make his already existing people of God holy by cleansing them from the pollution and dominion of sin so that we have true access to God. So verse 11 to 14, he sat down. Okay, the sacrifice was sufficient enough to allow the Son to enter heaven, clear away, clear the way for us to have access to God. Okay? It was not the tearing of the, the temple curtain that gave us access. That just showed us that God wasn't there in that old sanct uh, 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 tabernacle. Tabernacle. tabernacle, sanctuary. That's the word I was thinking. <clears throat> the cross is the means to the throne where Christ is permanently seated so he can empower us to faithfully persevere. And you know what that means? But when we take communion, one of the, one of the things that, we, we, that a lot of people do wrong is that we make communion because the elements of the bread and the, and the cup seem to focus on the cross. We forget that there is a cross and a throne involved here. And, and what the, the communion table is really saying, because Jesus said, he said, said, take this cup, because it is what? The new covenant. What's the new covenant? A new nature and access to God. So the focus of the communion <coughs> table, when we take these elements, the focus is not the cross alone. The focus is really the fact that he's sitting 
at the right hand of God in heaven, having completed it all, giving us a new nature and access to God, and now we're just waiting until the day that he comes and uh, consummates the whole thing. That's why he said in 1 Corinthians 11, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me until I... God. And, and we forget that middle part. A lot of people will they'll just focus on the cross, or, or they'll, they'll, they'll mention the cross and the second coming. But they don't realize that unless he's sitting beside God, sitting, having completed, there is no consummation. And that sitting shows that what he did on the cross has been efficient, sufficient, and complete. So the real focus of the, of the communion table is not that Jesus died or that he's coming again, but that he is right now sitting in heaven on the throne. That's the focus. And, and that's what the Hebrews is bringing out. He says, why would you go back to a system then that is, doesn't do that? It can't do that for you at all. It says you've got it through Christ. Verse 11 pictures the priest of the old system as standing and piling up sacrifice after sacrifice as hard as they can go, but it's all in vain, for they can never reach their goal. They can never sit down because their job is never done. I like this phrase. I got this from, I can't remember who I got it from. I didn't reference it. A perpetually standing priest was an eff was an ineffective priest. A perpetually standing priest was an ineffective priest. Verse 12, Christ sat down in fulfillment of the invitation of God in Psalm 110 to show that his self-sufficient sacrifice accomplished its goal. Christ's sacrifice is finished and his reign is made possible by it. So you can't, you still can't separate the, the, the throne from the cross. Okay, they, they go together, and then the coming, they all go together. But our greater focus really is on where the fulfillment of it. Verse thirteen then is God's invitation to the Son in Psalm one hundred ten verse one has been fulfilled. Sit at my right hand, but His promise in Psalm one hundred ten verse eleven b still waits to be consummated. That is until I make your enemies the footstool for your feet. That's why God said that we celebrate the Lord's table until He comes. I guess I already said that. That is the consummation of the plan of redemption. So there's three directions that we're to look at when we come to the communion table. Backwards to the cross, upwards to the throne, and forward to the consummation. It's all part of it. There's nothing more that needs to be done for God's people to be delivered from sin and brought into God's presence. So here in summary. Got rid of all of that stuff. He is the greater high priest because he entered the greatest sanctuary in heaven in the presence of God and offered the greatest sacrifice, a perfect, righteous, spotless Lamb of God, which is sufficient for the sins of the whole world and only required once to inaugurate the greatest covenant, the new covenant. I like what Charles Spurgeon said, My faith rests not in what I am, or shall be, or feel or know, but on what Christ is, in what He has done, and in what He is now doing for me. Every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifice, thus it was necessary for this priest, Christ, also to have something to offer. And what He had to offer was His own life, once and it was sufficient to deal with the sin problem and the separation problem. Isn't that amazing news? Isn't it? It, just, it just should thrill our hearts and cause us to really worship our God. Okay, well, 